As we go into your word, we ask that your counsel will stand. Let your will be done. Circumcise every heart. Let your word come with uncommon power. Like fire to burn every resistance as a hammer to break every hardness. Speak to us. Help us to receive your word and help us to run with it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Please let me put your hands together for the choir. The Lord take you from glory to glory in Jesus' name. I'm going to be speaking on something that I've titled More Than Enough. And I'm really hoping we can talk as one family. This is not for those outside here and outside Christendom because they don't have the DNA to receive it. A man can only give what he has. Four background texts, main one being Genesis 26. In the interest of time, we won't read, but I will paraphrase. Familiar story of Isaac wanting to check out in a famine. And he was heading towards Egypt, but God told him, don't jack by there, stay where I will show you. And he led him to Gera, the land of the Philistines. And he prospered there. But as a stranger prospering in the midst of natives, he provoked envy, he provoked jealousy, he provoked opposition. And three times, they blocked his wells. If you know what wells meant to somebody who thrives on agriculture, that you, you know in the palace, they blocked his supply lines. They truncated his supply chain. But each one, he will just shake it off, trusting in his God, he didn't fight. He outlasted the opposition until finally, they let him be. And the ten people who had told him, you have become too wealthy, too powerful for us, please leave us, came back later to say, we want to have a covenant with you because we can see that God is with you so that you won't attack us in future. And when we become poor, while you become rich, you will still have mercy on us. The Lord made more than enough room for him and even for the opposition. You know, Yoruba people have a saying, Oju arun fu. The sky is big enough for all birds, natural ones and mechanical ones, to move around without clashing into each other. Of course, a few accidents happen, but the space, the, the real message is about the space. The fact that you light your candle from mine doesn't mean mine will go out. There is enough room for everyone. In Genesis 16, it wasn't a stranger alone, but she was a slave who had been used to advance the family's gains. But when the tide turned, she was kicked out like a nobody the story of Hagar, the Egyptian slave. And even the man of the house, whose hair she had given birth to, maltreated her and kicked her out. I've always wondered about that. They gave her just a jar of water, no escort, no nothing, with a newborn baby. And say, your madam says to kick you out, I kick you out. But thank God for the God who sees us. Glory to the one who hears us. 
At the time in the desert when she had run out of water and could not bear to look at her child dying and was trying to look away, God showed up for her. And she was able to say, by the time you get to verse 13 and verse 14, she gave praise to the Lord who sees me and the Lord who hears me. I've come to tell somebody, God sees you. God hears you. In Numbers 27 and 36, we meet a bunch of young ladies. And I can identify with this. Because I have daughters. I don't miss no son. These ones are more than three sons each. I remember my boss was asking me, are you going to try once more? I had a good laugh. I said, from way in memorial, I've always said, one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Spirit. I have three, no more. I said, well, this man, he may not have the frame of mind to understand this well, so let me tell him in another way. I said, I wasn't too bright in school, though, but I paid small attention to mathematics. And there was a part of mathematics called linear mathematics. So if I went the first time, fire came, one. And then second time, twins. If I now say I'm looking for a boy, what do you think will happen? Even if God answers me, three boys. I said, I didn't want a basketball team. I'm fine, three. Glory be to God. In Numbers 27 and 36, we met the descendants of a man called Zelophehad. He had only daughters and he died. And as at that time, women were not regarded. They were not rated, second class at best. And so they could not inherit property. And they were going to be disenfranchised. All the uncles were already, probably already lying in wait. But then, they took their case to Moses. And Moses said, even though I'm the leader, I have to be careful. You know, your authority only stems from the people. So let me not do what will cost me trouble. So he went to the Lord. And the Lord said, those young ladies are correct. And from that time, women had inheritance rights in that nation. But then, you know how stubborn we can be. We don't give up. But fast forward nine more chapters. Their brethren started saying, hey. they went back to Moses. They said, we remember that judgment you gave, but we have a concern. You know, land, we shared land according to tribe. If these women marry outside the tribe, it therefore means their new husbands or their husbands will inherit, and so our own will be reducing, and their own will increase. Moses said, what kind of wahala is this? Well, there was one who changed the order. Let me go back to him. And he went back to God. And God said, they are right. For as long as they marry within their tribe, the land stays within the tribe. But if they marry outside, they can't go with it. Too. It has to be here. So it was up to the young ladies. If you are not hung up on land, go marry outside. If you are going to follow love, I mean, you want your land calculating, stay inside. Again, all parties were sorted out because you are dealing with a God of Rehoboth who has more than enough room for everyone. I've said it before, and we just finished a study of a character in the Bible. We've been studying characters in the Bible during the midweek service, and we just finished Rehab. I said, if I were the one who approved of the Bible, you know, there are some characters that I probably would not put their stories in there. Because it is human nature to always want to paint a rosy picture. And when we have objections to certain things, we want to exclude them. Who we want to write that Noah got drunk? After surviving flood, he now got drunk in a way that caused trouble for his descendants. Or who will write that Rahab, prostitute? Oh, sorry, we call them commercial sex workers now, right? not only enjoyed the mercy of God, but she became ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Prostitute, Olosho, Ron's girl. 
Many of you will, ex I mean, you will edit that out. But we are dealing with a God who does not exclude. Everyone society excludes, God includes. Everyone looked down on, God lifts up. Those who are rejected, God accepts them. Have you not noticed? Lepers. Jesus touched one. People that if you are here, they were over there, they were supposed to be announcing and run away. Jesus not said, he didn't speak a word. He actually touched. Which will have made him to be outside. But he was sending a message. Slaves. He said in the gospel, masters, be kind to your servants and to your slaves. Because in Christ, you saw how he wrote about, um, to Philemon, about the other one. He wrote, he said, look, even you, you are in the, so treat your slave like your equal. Thank God we don't do slaves anymore. And the one that's always knocked my socks off is how in his ministry, the Lord lifted women up repeatedly. Who are those who bankrolled his ministry the most? Women. If you don't know, go back to Sunday school. Go check. Go do Bible study. Who are the people entrusted with the biggest news in history that first saw him? Women. When the men ran away, who stood? When the men didn't believe, who went to the place to do what was needed? Who broke expensive perfume? And washed his feet with tears. Men, some of us we cry, but we don't cry enough to become enough to wash feet. And took her crowning glory, not a rag, not towel, to wipe his feet. So you think he will not rate women? Have you wondered why he created women after us? You know the better comes after the previous one. He has more than enough room. Amen. Now, I've set this stone because I want to weigh on a contemporary issue. And for some of you who have the wrong impression that we should not talk politics, I've come to bust your bubble. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has not come to establish religion. He came to do what? Establish what? A kingdom. He kept saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is what? Please Google your Bible, search in your Bible the word kingdom, especially in the New Testament. And what is his number one title? King of kings and and is exalted above what? All principalities and He came and he said, on his shoulders will be what? The government. Jesus came to establish kingdom. And kingdoms are known for what? Authority, power, and dominion. When he was living, what did he say he had given you and me? Please. To do what? To do what? Trample. He didn't give us power just to pray. And study the scriptures. Those are good. But after that, he said, wield authority within your domain, your own space, in your house. Keep negativity away. Keep evil away. You rule. Whatever you decree is what will be established. He said he was the king of Israel, the Lord Jehovah. And so when they wanted to be like other kingdoms and were looking for an earthly king, he was hurt. He said, you are rejecting me. But he said, no problem. I will still be the king maker. Why do you think God was interested in establishing kings if he's not interested in politics and governance? We have left things for too long out of ignorance. We should only pray here. And then the other side runs the agenda while we are at the receiving end. Thank God our eyes don't clear. And our eyes go open more in the mighty name of Jesus. Our roles as Christians aren't just to read the scriptures and pray, but to exercise dominion by governing, even after reading the scriptures and praying. Because if we really know the scriptures, we won't be where we are today. 
where the tail is wagging the dog. Because we left room for child. And they can only give of their father and give of their values while you and I will be at the receiving end. And so recent developments got me worried. In the last four, five, six years, you've been seeing some trends. It started in Europe, Greece, Spain, France, America under Trump. And then it came here. Oh, it happened. We became, as, we became more divided than ever before. And people started identifying by their ethnic groups and things of that nature. There is nothing wrong. Because in all sincerity, most of us, that's our primary thing. Nigeria is somewhat distant. But the problem is when you want to advance your own at the expense of others. And it becomes more uh, worrisome when you see that within the body of Christ. This last election, I saw vileness. Ugly. Let me speak it like that. Ugliness. Eh? Ugliness. But that's how nasty it was around us and even among so-called believers. I saw bigotry. Full disclosure. If you are a citizen or if you are born again and Jesus is your Lord, you know we all come from only one place. The kingdom of Zion. But then we may land in Nigeria, we may land in America, and in landing in Nigeria, by my name, unless you are some of my friends on the other side in the Niger Delta, who, despite being there, they bear names from everywhere else. But seriously, I'm, an, I'm a Yoruba man. My wife is Igbo. My child is part Yoruba, part Igbo. So where I'm going, full disclosure, you can filter it as you like but I will go there as the Spirit of God has led me. But by the grace of God, I have a household that is not the average. All these women, they've lived in three continents. Me, I manage to. So their outlook is different. And we started seeing all of us acting contrary to scripture. Let me help us again. Just look at the scriptures and all the people that God has used. Were they perfect? Abraham maltreated his wife. He said, Priester, Sote Abimelech carry him enter in Harem. And Pharaoh did the same thing. And I've always said it God is faithful. God showed up for him. Abimelech could not do him, but the Bible doesn't tell us what happened when she was in Pharaoh's zone, but I know that God was faithful too. But only God knew how much indignities Pharaoh may have subjected her to before God, you know? Father Abraham, oh, he said, you know, they can kill me because of you. Why you no one die for your wife now? And if you know God will protect you, why did he resort to carnal measures? And yet God used him. And we are still Abraham's seed, blessed till tomorrow. But he was a stranger in Gera. He was a stranger in Egypt. Do you know which nation he will come from today? Iraq. His roots, Iraqi, all of the Chaldeans, Iraq. And that's the, descent, the ancestry of the Lord Jesus Christ. David, David did all kinds of bad, 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 bad things. So they, God, say, you know, if he built a temple for me. But let's just look at one. He seduced his close friend's wife, killed her husband to cover up his tracks, and yet this is the one that God says, a man after my heart. Heart. We've talked about Rahab. There was that woman by Sika in John 4. We don't know her name. Serial divorcee. 
if she comes into the church, now some of you will relocate. You change your seats. Or if you can't, you don't look at her. Yet, God had more than enough room to accommodate that person. Have you observed that the Ten Commandments, four of them, are, they define our relationship with God? The first four. But the remaining six, what do they do? They define our relationship with fellow human beings. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he reiterated that in Luke chapter 10. When that young lawyer, no, it wasn't the young lawyer, it was a teacher of the law, asked him, what is the most important commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your, and love your neighbor as yourself. And to cap it, he now gave the parable of the good Samaritan. If you know anything, Ogoni fight was small compared to how Jews and Samaritans regarded each other. And then he said, see, bishop dodged. Walker dodged. Congregation member dodged. But an unbeliever, the one you won't rate, is the one that took care of him and was a real neighbor to him. Aren't you glad we are in Christ today, you and I? If the Jews had their way, will salvation ever come to me or to you? But then God burst their bubbles. He upturned the status quo. And you, me, and many others, non-Jews, or is there any one of us who's a Jew here? I hear my in-laws from the East say they are from Israel. We are yet to prove that. But... Let's thank God that he has accepted us among his beloved ones. Because if he was left to man and religion, you and I will be outside the commonwealth of Zion. And yet, till tomorrow, God will continue to make room for his own. In Galatians 3, 28 to 29, Paul emphasizes this point. Galatians 3, 28 and 29 says, In Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew. Slave and free, male and female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, since you are Christ's family, then you are Abraham's famous descendant, heirs according to the covenant promises. So the question that bothered me in the midst of all of this, is how, despite the examples and lessons from history, how can anyone profess Christ and still champion tribe, ethnicity, at the detriment of others? How can? How do you justify thinking, speaking, and behave wrong, behaving wrongly towards another, even a fellow believer made like you in the image of our Heavenly Father? Even if they acted wrongly or provoked you, what does the Bible teach about how we are to respond? I had lunch with a couple of my mentees. They're a couple, husband and wife, on Thursday. They said, oh, we know you are traveling. It was my birthday on Friday, so they took me out to lunch. And after they had fed me well, well, there was just this jab that came. He said, so how are you uh, non-bigoted, redeemed pastors dealing with the bigots in your midst? Ah, I was like, where's And they quoted one guy on social media who claims he's a redeemed pastor, well-known. I said, Daddy Gio must hear about this. Apostle must hear about this. We have to do something because that guy is not helping us. Rebid follower of one party, and very bigoted things on his timeline. But what he told me was that he was killing the testimony and witness for the rest of us because, thank God, those ones knew me enough to make that distinction. But what do you think others are saying when they think that must be, because people can generalize easily, must be our stance, generally speaking. And in many respects, are they wrong? 
Because if it's not tribal bigotry, aren't we bigoted in terms of denomination sometimes? There were times we thought if you were not in RCCG, you won't make heaven. Thank you, gatekeepers of heaven. <laughs> now, now hold the key to admit, Abby. God's personal assistance that determines who comes in and who goes. But thank God we've been humbled on that. So the question then is, where is the example of Christ and the apostles in this outlook of ours that we are portraying today? In our utterances and actions, how did the apostles contend with opposition? If you go to Acts 3 or so, Peter led the prayer. He said, look, Father, back us up with signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. They didn't say, let fire come down and consume opposition. They locked Paul and Silas in prison. What were they doing? They were worshipping God. They weren't calling God to come and destroy everybody. They did not remind them that, you know, all these people, we accommodated them all. But let me ask us, if in the midst of all of this, all that has happened, you have not even been bothered and you felt serves them right or it's okay, your heart did not skip a bit over how things went, whether you are actively participating or quietly acquiescing to developments, then what I do? At least that's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13. He says, test yourselves to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourself regular checkup. You need first-hand evidence, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. I think another version says that you are still in the faith. You need to check. Test it out. If you fail the test, then do something about it. But if you are bothered, I mean, let me tell you, election day, I couldn't vote. The three of us. Three minutes or so, fourth in line to vote. Suddenly from nowhere, I heard pak, 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 behind me. I thought it was bullets in the first instance. You're very bold man facing militants and everything. Survival instinct, first thing. Because as soon as I turned, a lock bar don't fall. I neck officials were rolling on the ground and I was about to trip over them. So then I stopped. Uh -uh. I did not come alone. I came with two women. And I turned back to be the brave guy. And I saw my chest is facing me. I was, because the first backpack I had were bottles and I thought they were gunshots. And then again, you know, I go to Ferry. But the glory of God, when I looked, fire had done Ben Johnson, Usain Bolt, and got towards the main road and came back with his military. Her mother, had done Wonder Woman. And where, and I saw the young Inek lady, the copper, she dusted me. And everybody was going one way. And then, you see, still in my, should I rescue? Should you, Father, take control? I went one strange place that people were not supposed to, all manner of stones. And, so I sprained my left toe. Until now, uh, you know, when you get to an age, things don't, they don't heal as quickly as before. That's where you know you are not a spring chicken anymore. But can you imagine the infra dig? Let me speak that old grammar. The effrontery. Some young urchins misguided disenfranchised me on that day. And I couldn't vote. Because by the time we regathered strength and came back, Everything scattered, and the poor copper's phone was stolen. Who moaned about how she just saved to get her phone, and now they've stolen. I, I was like, if she will only wait and listen, we will contribute money for phone. Let's gather the polling things and still make sure. They said, no, they were not voting again. I was wondering again, was this an RNG safe? So I was ready that for the next one, I'm coming with my dog. You know, because somebody had asked me initially, will you go there? I said, ah, that would be like taking a weapon to the polling booth. The law says no weapons. But then other people came with weapons. 
And then they messed it up. They postponed it. I mean, I had had my life scheduled. I traveled. So I didn't vote presidential because some thugs disturbed me. And I couldn't vote second one because I neck and in his wisdom, I got his franchised. But I was ready to do what I could. I made noise. I was going to bring my dog and do whatever. But if you didn't do something, you need to do something. If your heart did not grieve over injustice, because those who attacked us, they profiled us. Yoruba man that I was, they profiled me to be something else and decided to disfranchise us. We need, you need to do something if your heart is pricking you. And if it is not, it's time to do so. And that will include some repentance. Repentance for any hidden bias, prejudices in the heart. Because, you see, we cannot look good, but God sees the heart. If you didn't, because a lot of people were shocked. I'm on, I'm on several chat groups. There was no group that this bus boost didn't happen. Especially once the governorship election was coming in Lagos. There was no group that this bus boost didn't happen. Even our men's group in Promised Land. And we had to stop people posting and only admin school post. This was how we had been divided. Allowed the enemy to dictate things for us. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And there was a lot of sorcery going around over these elections. But we yielded our knees because we didn't know who we are. We didn't know our identity. We bought into the wrong narrative. Same thing with my old school network. We stopped them and the admins are quick now. Somebody posts, they delete it immediately and warn them. And I see that in other groups. There's still one mad one that is mostly political. I still stay there and I listen. Once in a while, I just tell them, you people, election don't pass. You are still doing as if you are campaigning. Both sides going at it. No wisdom. No restraint. And there are blames for both sides and all sides in the equation. There are blames. But it's not about this. It's about what will we do in Christ, what will God have us do? What does the Spirit of the Lord say? We must repent. We must seek God to identify and address the root of our own biases. Because for many of us, some hidden things came out this period. I saw people speaking that I rated highly. And they just started to shrink before one's eyes. In one particular group, somebody who just joined I mean, we graduated school over four decades ago. We only just found him from somewhere. And he just got admitted. And he was very influential in pumping things up. And before you knew it, a few others latched on and justifying. And people kept saying, what binds us here? And the school we went to, we were devoid of these considerations. We didn't even bother to know where anybody came from. Thank God reason prevailed predominantly. And we had to keep the bond of brotherliness in that place. How is it going in your own environment? I don't know, but you know and God knows. But anything short of repentance, seeking to address the root of things, and learning to truly walk in the love of God, any justification of any of these things, um, failing to do these things, any excuse, it won't cut it with God. And it, won't, it will mar our testimony with those that we are supposed to minister to. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ called us, his followers, to love, to a love that is all-embracing. It is not a love that is conditional. It is not a love that says you must qualify. It is not a love that is based on temperament. He calls us to welcome people. In Luke 9, 40, it says, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. We are meant to welcome people regardless of what they can do for us, regardless of what they can do for us, regardless of where they are from. And we need to remember ultimately that what unites us in Christ is infinitely more important than what divides us. For in God, there is more than 
enough room. The God who accommodated a prostitute, a murderer, the seeming misogynist, a persecutor of the church, he's more than able. He has more than enough room. He's the God of Rehoboth. I ask you to just bow your head now and let's address some things. Let's repent of every prejudice, every bias, every wrong mindset, all of these things that are not of God and are incompatible with his kingdom, his character, his nature, his values, and the ways of being and doing things. Let's just repent of them right now. I say, Father, I didn't know this was hiding in my heart, but I saw it come out this period. Please forgive me. I repent. Let's repent of every wrong word, whether it was spoken or typed, or it was an illustration. And then let's split the precious and powerful blood of Jesus Christ over every bitterness that arose. Because if you were especially at the receiving end, you are likely bitter. Every offense, every wound that has been inflicted over you, plead the blood of Jesus and say, I release myself from the consequences, from the effects and the influence thereof. I delete them from my life in the mighty name of Jesus. And then let's declare, according to Romans 5.5, 5, that the love of God that has been deposited in my heart and that dwells there will not be choked out, will not just be latent in there, but it will well up and overflow and overcome every hatred, every prejudice, in the mighty name of Jesus. Let me pray that you'll overcome every bigotry, violence that they have my contracted from others or I myself may have exhibited. And depending on what was done to you and how you felt, how badly it made you feel, I want to remind you that others may have derided you. They may not even rate you. But let me assure you, man's opinion is not what counts. It's God's reckoning that counts. God knows you. As Agar found out in Genesis 16, God hears you and he sees you. You are not insignificant. You may be a single parent, you may be a divorcee, a widow. You may not have what will even provide the next meal. I hope not. You may fall into a category that makes you vulnerable in society. Or that doesn't make society rate you. I want you to know that to God, you are significant. You are precious to him and he has room for you. He won't exclude you. Rather, he will continue to include you because with him there is more than enough room to accommodate you and accommodate everyone else. The choir is going to lead us in a song. I want you to sing it with appreciation even as I bring this message to a close. I want you to sing it and hold on dear to it. He knows my name. I have a maker. He formed my heart. He never
Amen.